Now, in Finnegan's case, what we're looking at is a private act by a private body, the union. And what we have is public opposition to this act. And the question, what we're looking at today, is how is the judiciary meant to deal with this kind of a situation? Now, what was the act in question? It was, in fact, a decision by New Zealand Rugby Union to send a team to play against the Springboks during the apartheid regime. Now, the world was squarely against South African apartheid. New Zealand had signed on to the Glen Eagles Agreement. It was a pledge, essentially, to discourage contact between Kiwis, between New Zealand nationals, with South African sporting events as a way to place pressure on South Africa and get them to reform their system of apartheid. So there was a conflict which began um, when there was an all-whites tour to New Zealand in 1981. Now the protests were in fact quite severe and it forced games behind barbed wire and under police surveillance. And in 1985, what we have is an invitation on the part of South Africa to the All Blacks to send an All Whites team to play against the Springboks. This is what we have in 1985. And the Council of the Union, so the Council of the Union, decides to accept the invitation. They accept the invitation, they announce that they've accepted the invitation, and all of a sudden there are protests, and the decision is challenged by two rugby playing lawyers. So these two members, Finnegan and Recordin, challenge the decision. They said there are two reasons why this tour should be stopped. One, it would sully the image and reflect poorly on the sport of rugby. The union has a duty to promote the sport of rugby and to uphold its image. This is in the union's constitutive rules. What they're saying is that this act will sully the image and reflect poorly on the sport, ergo it would be a breach of the union's constitutive rules. What they also say is that the council lacked authority to make such a decision. Now the union, of course, opposed these claims. We have the high court ruling. We have the high court ruling. The high court found that the union had authority to make the decision. What the court also found is that the plaintiffs did not have standing to sue. So when you're referring to standing, the question is, do you have a legal right to bring a case? So the question is before the court of appeal, because Finnegan, of course, challenges the high court's ruling. Finnegan challenges this and says, the union did not have authority, and we do have standing to sue. So the questions before the Court of Appeal, did the council have authority, and whether or not the plaintiffs had standing? And the thing that you need to keep in mind is which claim has not been ruled on. Number one, it would sully the image and reflect poorly, has not been in fact decided by the High Court. So that matter cannot come before the Court of Appeals until it is resolved by the High Court. Did the union have authority to make the claim? The Court of Appeals ruled that yes, the union does have authority to make a decision unless, unless it was contrary to the will of the membership. What the court also says is that there is no obligation on the part of the council to seek approval from the membership. So plaintiffs lose on this one. The second issue, standing. This is a private matter. This is a matter between two private individuals and a private body. Now, as private parties, the plaintiffs would have standing if there was a contract between the union and themselves. So we have here the union, we have a club, and we have Finnegan. Finnegan has a relationship here, sorry, here, and there is a contractual relationship here, but that does not mean that there's a contractual relationship here. So we're looking at it and we're saying there is no contractual relationship between 
this private individual and this private body. So that is one test for standing. But there is another approach to standing. That other approach is known as the Stininato approach. Standing to claim that an incorporated society acted beyond its powers exists for a person affected by the challenged decision. For purposes of the Stininato doctrine, being affected implies some form of adverse financial or employment consequences. So the High Court said there is no standing because there is no contract, there is no material harm, and there is no adverse consequence to Finnegan or Recordin's employment. The Court of Appeals, though, has a different opinion. And what the Court of Appeals says is that the importance of the subject matter outweighs the absence of any material loss. When we say the importance of the subject matter, what are we referring to? The previous two are divided the nation, so this is very similar. Precisely. So the previous two are, we're looking at what happened just four years prior, and we're anticipating the fallout, the consequences of the council's decision. So what the court says, in this particular case, we are not willing to apply to the question of standing the narrowest of criteria that might be drawn from private law fields. What are some of the key words here? Private law. Private law, precisely. Not willing and private law. So the law is very clear here as to how one has standing. But what the court says is that we're not willing to apply that doctrine. The subject matter is too important. And so we're not willing to limit our examination to a doctrine derived from private law. We will draw upon a doctrine from public law. Right now what we have is the matter has gone before the High Court to rule on the first claim. It would sully the image and reflect poorly on the sport of rugby. Why are they looking to this? Because in the union's constitutive rules, it has a duty to promote the sport of rugby. Simple as that. If they were to engage in an action that would be in contravention of that duty, then someone withstanding can bring a claim against them saying they, as a member or as someone withstanding, are going to suffer a harm. What is that harm? What we have in the end is the reputation of rugby is going to suffer. And the union has a duty, according to its own constitutive rules, to promote the game in New Zealand and abroad. And what Justice Casey said, the union was in breach of its constitutive rules because it did not consider the consequences. So the damage here is to the reputation of New Zealand rugby. So the court granted the interim injunction, restraining the union from proceeding with the tour. Until when? until the case is actually heard. Because remember, we're only at the interim injunction stage. Now, the matter is going to go for a full hearing, but in the meantime, the union cannot send a team. The court's ruling did not replace the union's decision. What the court was saying is that the union merely had to carry out it's decision-making in honest and good faith. Because what the union was being faulted for was not the decision, but the fact that they did not consider the consequences of their decision on the image of the game. 